Um, Proverbs 9, 12 through 8. Folly is an unruly woman. She is simple and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house on a seat at the highest point of the city, calling out to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Let all who are simple come to my house. To those who have no sense, she says, stolen water is sweet. Food eaten in secret is delicious. But little do they know that the dead are there, that her guests are deep in the realm of the dead. (laughs) Proverbs has uh, a lot of wisdom in it. And it's... um, Proverbs 9, 12 through 8 tells us what a temptation can be uh, and um, what, so how sometimes we can act foolishly without even knowing it because it looks good, it looks appealing, but it's not really. So how do we get there? How does it all begin? How do we fall into this addiction? We don't even know it. First, I want to define, as I always do, I like to define words. I want to define the word addicted. The word addict comes from the Latin word adicer, which means to say. This translates to the word assigned, which in a sense means bound or devoted to someone or something. You're assigned to something. You're enslaved. So addiction is being enslaved. In a biblical sense, an addict is bound or devoted to someone or something other than God. The addict is no longer worshiping God. He or she is now living an adulterous life. I'm sorry, an idolatrous life. In other words, we have something else that's our idol other than God. That's what an addict is. Of course, in common culture, um, an addict is is, uh, a negative thing. It's a negative... um, Description of someone. Um, it could also be a positive thing because an addict can be someone who's addicted to God. But that's not usually how it's used. So, how do we get there? How do we become addicted to anything? Um, as a non believer, um, you live your life and you go through your day and everything and everything seems right and you're, you're doing everything like everyone else does in the world. How did you get there? How did you get to a place that was dark and sad and crumbling? And as a believer, where, where you, you read your scriptures every day, uh, you do the same thing as everyone else in the world. You get up, you eat your breakfast, you go to work. But as a believer, how do you get there? We're going to talk about those things. Um, and these are the things that I got out of the book and out of this chapter uh, that, that I find are, are very important to understand that we sometimes are not aware because even though the spirit is strong and the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So how do we get here? I'm going to quote uh, a paragraph from the book um, in the beginning part of chapter 4. It once was thought that those who were susceptible to addictions became addicts the moment they tried their desired substance or activity. While it is true that some people seem to fall in love quickly, for for most people, idolatry is a slowly developing courtship. Idolatry is a gradual journey that begins even before the first shot of booze, internet hit, toke of a marijuana cigarette, or bulimic binge. Let me add to that. That's the end of this paragraph, but let me add to that. It begins before the first visit to a casino, conversation with that woman or man, or that first video game. Brother Eric already uh, explained uh, the other week uh, how some may not, may be or may not be more prone uh, to addiction based on the genetic makeup, uh, the environment they live in, uh, family lifestyle or circumstances in one's life or that may have some impact on what choices we make. However, the truth is that we have already fallen 
into sin. We were born in the pit. Then without Adam's help, we made further descents on our own. It's a matter of our will. It's a matter of the choices that we make. Psalms 14.3 expresses that best. All have turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one that does good. Not even one. Being unprepared or indifferent. The beginning of rebellion does not happen suddenly. Oftentimes, we don't even see it coming. Generally, we are living our lives as normal. We get up every morning, do our morning routine, go to work, finish the workday, eat dinner, then we socialize, do chores around the house, spend time with friends and family, and then we go to bed. A normal day. Sounds innocent enough. Just a normal routine. After all, those things are what we do to get through a typical day. This is what's called spiritual casualness or indifference. It's not thinking of, it's thinking of yourself and your day-to-day mundane things. It's not thinking of growth. It's not sp- thinking of God. It's not thinking of other people. It's thinking of your, your personal needs. We get stuck in that. Now, as a non-believer, these things are all, these are all th- uh, one things that are needed to live a successful life. Considering one's creator as Lord never comes to mind. Work is your Lord. Family and friends are your Lord. Having fun is the Lord. Trying to succeed in life in this world is all one feels is necessary as a non-believer. When life gets tough, as it does for everyone, one turns to other things to try to achieve that fulfillment and happiness one had before things were tough. We perhaps start to drink more regularly or drink at all if we didn't. Perhaps when your marriage is struggling, you may start a relationship or friendships outside of the marriage. Now, as a believer, if you exercise spiritual casualness, it is primarily because you have lost your focus on your Lord, on the true Lord. Some may take it for granted that since I'm saved, I'm safe. Are we really? One's life may have become too stagnant and mundane uh, for one, and one forgets uh, who he or she is or why he or she is here. One goes through the motions, for example. You go to church every Sunday as a believer. You read your Bible as a believer. You attend Bible studies. However, you're still not feeling fulfilled. In both cases, of the believer and the non-believer, Outwardly, everything seems all right. You're doing all the right things. You're doing everything that's expected of you. You even look at yourself and you feel as though you're doing everything right. You're trying to satisfy those needs. You're going through the motions. In both cases, as a believer or a non-believer, your family doesn't recognize that you might be struggling doesn't recognize that you might be looking for something else because everything seems all right on the surface. There are subtle changes that always go unrecognized. Now, believers, please be on your guard at all times. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says, Be alert and sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And in James 1, 22, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You might remember that that was a memory verse not that long ago. And that's one of the reasons we have to remember that. As believers, we must. We must remember. But I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone because we all, 
we all sometimes fall astray. So sometimes we lose focus. And that's why we have friends. That's why we have uh, church. That's why we have family. Now, now, now to the non-believers, if you do not know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I beg you, I plead to you, listen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for you, just like he died for me and everyone else in here. He came to this earth as an example. He paid the penalty for us, the penalty that we can't pay. He is our only hope. He suffered on the cross and took our sins in exchange for his righteousness. He died and he was buried. And he rose again. Anyone in here who does not believe that, I pray that, that you would talk to someone and, and discuss your concerns and discuss this with anyone because he is our only hope. Without him, we're stuck in this world. Without him, we die in this world. But with Jesus, as he rose again, we live again. And there is a hope. I know this, uh, this uh, chapter uh, very well uh, because as I've gone through my addiction, I, I didn't notice it was happening. I didn't uh, recognize that my life was changing for the worse. Um, in in uh, 1999, when I became a Christian, everything changed for the good. You know, I stopped drinking, I stopped gambling, I stopped swearing, I stopped smoking for a time. Um, I stopped hanging out with um, a lot of bad people. I stopped going to places that were a bad influence. I stopped, I stopped, I stopped. It wasn't anything that I did but it was something that I wanted to do because I changed. The Lord changed me. So as a believer, everything always seems so good. You know, and um, if you don't stay focused in, in, in exactly what happened to you as a believer, all those good things, all those changes of your heart, all that softening of your heart, receiving a new heart, as Jesus had promised, taking out that old heart of stone and putting in a new heart of flesh and becoming a new person. Um, we take things for granted sometimes as human beings and uh, we forget that uh, uh, we have to keep calling out to our Lord. We have to keep uh, fellowshipping with our, our, our fellow believers and we have to continue to move forward and not backwards. But even that being said, you know, uh, in my life, it was, uh, no, I, I didn't count this up. About five years uh, where I was living a, a, a good, strong Christian life, where I was growing. I wasn't growing as well as I, I thought I should. I wasn't exactly getting the best teaching or the best uh, counsel, but... Uh, I was always in fellowship with somebody at church, you know, and God was always revealing himself in my life where I could, you know, build my faith because he was showing up. And um, one way or another, miraculously or not. Uh, but after a while, I became complacent, and I think that's what happens a, a lot of times to a lot of us as believers, and it certainly happens to non-believers. We become complacent with our lives. Everything becomes routine. Everything becomes mundane. And um, we forget. So where does it all begin? Where does the descent into addiction begin? I know the first time before I was a believer, it was, it was easy because I, I, I didn't have a real life. I didn't have the Lord in my life. I was always seeking for something. And, and um, you know, it was kind of a, like a, a jump into addiction. It was a, a jump into gambling and drinking and hanging out with the wrong people and so forth and so on. Uh, but after I was a believer, how did this happen? How can it happen? And, and believe me, it can happen. It can happen. Um, my heart is different. You know, my love for people is, is a lot greater than it was well, before I believed in Jesus. Um, my love for the Lord is a lot greater than it was before I knew who he was. But it can happen because 
like I said in the beginning, we can take our own lives for granted and we can lose focus as to who we are. And we lose focus as to why we're here. Uh, that's one of the points of this whole ministry is to remind us and, and to counsel us and, and to lift each other up, uh, to, to remind us of the purpose, the reason why we're here. But when we're alone, and I was alone, and um, when we um, don't have fellowship, because over time I dropped out of fellowship, and when we don't have um, good, wise counsel around us, and for a while I had no good, wise counsel around me, except prayers to the Lord, and except the Bible, but I didn't have the encouragement of a human being, a believing human being. Every day was a little bit harder without fellowship. Every day was a little bit harder without um, community with other believers, without community with a family in a church, without community with Christ in his home. And um, we become complacent. And, and I'm going to use my life because I know it speaks to uh, many lives when it comes to addiction, how we, how we slip, how we slide. Uh, some people call it sliding back. Um, we take it for granted that because we are saved, we are safe. And the truth can't be, it can't be said that, it, that that's not true at all. We are not safe. We are never safe. The devil prowls constantly like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Someone who's vulnerable, like a Christian, who's taking his life for granted, is, 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 is uh, that's red meat for that lion. Um, walking around. But it happens slowly. Brothers and sisters, it happens slowly. One day you're, you're going to church. The next day you're in a small group. Uh, perhaps the next day you have a phone call with some friends from church. And then the com next week comes and you decide not to go to church. You decide not to answer those phone calls. You decide that your life is a little bit more important. You'll get back to it later. That's the beginning. That's the beginning of the descent into addiction as a believer. And, and I'd like to say that it's probably the beginning of the descent into addiction as a non-believer also. Uh, but um, we know better. But it can still happen to us. After a while, you, you're not in fellowship, and, and, and then you, and you start to remember that, um, you know, life wasn't all that bad. I still have God. I still pray to him. I still um, read the Bible. Life wasn't all that bad before I knew the Lord. That's a lie. Then you start to experiment again. There's peer pressure because you start talking to other people who aren't going to church because... You're going to run into other people at work that don't believe. You're going to run into other people at the grocery store that don't believe, and you start to act like them because you're not practicing to act like Christ. And you're going to say, just one time. And I know in my life it was just that one more time going to a casino. And um, it, it's sad to say that it was an exciting day to do that because I was... At a low point in my Christian life, I was at a low point in my life. And it's a sad day, or a sad thing to say that I actually looked forward to it. Just one, just one time. It's not going to hurt. I have control over this. We don't have any control. Just that one time makes it okay for the second time. I survived the first time. I'll be all right. It'll be okay. Maybe while I'm there, I'll have a drink this time. Just this one time. 
Before you know it, you become friends with that addiction. You start that relationship with that addiction. Um, before you know it, you're having fun with something of the world, something other than God. It becomes your new Lord all over again. James 4.4, 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. All it takes is fellowship with your, your fellow believers to remind you of scriptures like that. You adulterous people. In Colossians 2.20, it says, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? You know, the rules of this world is go ahead and do whatever it takes to be happy. Do whatever, do whatever it takes to, to feel good. That's the rules of this world. Whatever it takes that you don't step on anybody else's toes, it doesn't matter. That's one of the rules of this world. So even as a Christian, we can slide back. We have a friendship we have a friendship with that, with that uh, thing that we call fun, with that thing that we call entertainment, with that thing that we call um, a place where we feel comfortable. That little let L, Lord. That idol other than God. And before you know it, we're infatuated with it. I remember going to the casinos. I would go once. A month and a half later, I'd go again. Four weeks later, I would go the next time. Well, let's just do it again in a month. All right. Oh, wait. This is really fun. I can do this. I could do this every month. I'll be all right. It'll be just fine. I have enough money to do this. I have it all under control. And then you go in three weeks, and then two weeks, and then once a week. You're infatuated. You can't get enough. It's doing you really good. It's making you feel really good. And in my case, oh, I want a whole lot of money. Fact of the matter is, you're infatuated. That woman that's sitting on the hill calling you in, she's got you. 2 Corinthians 10, 4. The women, the women, the weapons we fight with, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Why didn't I call out to my Lord? Why didn't I call out to my friends? Because there's embarrassment at this point. There's denial at this point. At this point, there's, there's guilt. I'm a believer. How can I call out to anybody? I'm, I feel really bad. I feel really guilty. Not only do I feel guilty with friends and family, but I feel guilty to the Lord. However, 1 Corinthians 10.13, no, tempta no temptation has overtaken you except that is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond that by which you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Okay. Okay. I believe that. I understand that. When I get to the point where it's going to be so bad, then I'll turn to the Lord again and say, help. Then you're in love. Then you're in love with that thing. You're in love with that alcohol. 
You're in love with that affair. You're in love with that video game. You're in love with that, um, that drug. Then comes betrayal. Because that love doesn't last. That love that's, that's not real love. It's fake. You see how far I have fallen. You see how far we fall into addiction and how simple it was. Because it made us feel good. It made us feel wanted. It made us feel comfortable. How do we get here? We take our eyes off the Lord. Then we start to worship this, this, this addiction. And I know in, um, in my situation, it became a worship. It didn't matter. That's what I was going to do. I remember fixing my car once. The exhaust was bad. Nearly sliced my entire thumb off the top of my hand with a rotary tool because I was rushing so I can get to the casino that night. So I can spend uh, money that I didn't have because that was the rent money. How do you get there? How does this happen? I didn't know how I got there. I didn't see it coming. It was, it was far out. I thought I had control over everything. And anybody that's living in an addiction, addictive state like that deeply, they didn't know how they got there either. Their family didn't know how they got there. There might have been subtle signs, but you overlooked it because it seemed so normal. The rest of the world was that way. It seemed okay. Then that's all you want to do. It becomes your life. It becomes a part of who you are. It becomes all that you can do. And all that you can do is fight. You can fight for that, that thrill one more time. Whatever it takes. I don't have to eat this week. Maybe I'll hit it big. It's just like a drug addict. You know, I need that drug. If I don't get it, I'm not going to be able to live. It's going to be painful. How do you get there? It's a slow descent. It may have taken me five years. But there's good wisdom in the Bible. And, and, and this is why I, I call out to anybody who's not a believer, because the fact that I believe to begin with, I discovered myself at the bottom I discovered, uh, like Brother Luke likes to say, I looked up and saw bottom. But in my case, at that time, I looked up and I saw the door that led up to a ladder that led up to the bottom. <laughs> it was pretty low. And um, thank God, I had already accepted the Lord in my heart. Because I remembered suddenly, when I was at that deepest part of my life, that he was there when I called out to him the first time. And he's given me so many, so many wonderful things and, and, and proved himself and, and revealed himself in my life so many ways. How can I forget? And I remembered that uh, the, the, there was a, a life on the other side. There is a life that goes on forever. And there's a life that goes on with the Lord forever. So I called out to him again. And you remember this wisdom like I said in the beginning, Proverbs is full of good wisdom. In Proverbs 1, 8 through 33, I'll, I'll skip the beginning part, which just explains what I'm going to talk about. And listen, my son, to your father's instructions, and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. My son, if sinful men entice you, do not give in to them. If they say, come along with us, let's lie in wait for innocent blood, let's ambush some harmless soul, let's swallow them alive like the grave and whole like those who go down to the pit, 
we will get all sorts of valuable things and fill our houses with plunder. Cast lots with us. We will all share the loot. My son, do not go along with them. Do not set foot on their paths, for their feet rush into evil. They are swift to shed blood. How useless to spread a net where every bird can see it. These men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. Let me stop there. I'm going to stop there. I'll, I'll, I'll read the rest. That's exactly what addiction is. It's listening to lies. It's plundering what doesn't belong to you. It's uh, taking what others need. It's causing harm to the heart and lives of your family and friends. What does wisdom have to say? Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice to the public square. On the top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? That thrills my heart. How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. But since you refuse to listen when I call and no one pays attention when I stretch out my hand, since you disregard all my advice and do not accept my rebuke, I, in turn, will laugh when disaster strikes you. I will mock when calamity overtakes you. When calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when disaster and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. They will look for me, but, I will, not, but will not find me. Since they hated knowledge, and did not choose to fear the Lord. Since they would not accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes, for the waywardness of the simple will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear or harm. That's wisdom's rebuke. Think about that. Just listen. Just listen to good wisdom. I'm not, I'm not uh, directly calling anyone a fool, but I'm agreeing it's foolish to continue to walk downward. It's wise to continue to strive forward, to strive forward into the Lord. Amen. As believers, if we find ourselves in a place that we didn't know we, how we got there, if we find ourselves in a place where we don't know how to get out, trust the Lord. As believers, trust the Lord. I called out to the Lord for a second time in my life and asked for his intervention, asked for guidance, asked for that arrow that pointed directly to him and he is faithful. He is faithful. He loved you when you accepted him into your life. He didn't stop loving you. He will always love you. Call out to him. 